Deep in the American South, it's not defined as much a place as it is a time and a culture and a spirit. As many people live in a place, but only some are part of it, the community, embedded in it and embodied by it. This is where you will find Chandra McCormick and Keith Calhoun. And this is where you will find their work because the two are inextricably linked to the past and present, and more so since the last week of August in 2005, when Hurricane Katrina left its mark on more than just a place. Their work has been presented at the Venice Biennale, in museums, in magazines, in books, from the Ninth Ward of New Orleans. I'm very proud to welcome Chandra and Keith. Happy to be here. Um, Who that? <laughs> you that. <laughs> you that. In, in uh, the late 70s, I met my husband, who was a photographer at that time, and I wasn't. Um, and in 1980, I began working with him. And we, we documented a lot of um, New Orleans and the surrounding parishes in Louisiana. And our focus was on labor and the labor force of Louisiana. Um, Louisiana had a lot of sugarcane and cotton, and those were the things that we were trying to capture, like um, the, the last days of, of that mechanism had started taking over. So we were trying to capture the last workers. In 2005, Living in New Orleans, um, we had the devastation of Hurricane Katrina, and our whole archive was waterlogged. And so um, when we came back like 10 weeks later, we were going through everything, and the water was brown. And they were just soaking in it, and we didn't know what to do. Um, we were throwing a lot of things away because it was a lot of toxic uh, stuff, and we just didn't want to fool with it. And so. Um, we got a phone call while we were working, and it was our son. And he said, what are you doing? And we told him, and he said, are you sure you want to do that? And so um, we started, <laughs> made us think a little bit, and we saved a lot of the work by um, putting it in garbage bags. And um, we, yeah, and, and Keith can tell you his story of going on the street. We, we put them in the garbage bags, and we didn't know what we were going to do with them once we did that. And so he went out. I went out, and I found a big freezer. And um, we took it, took the work, and dumped it in the freezer. And I think, like, the next day, we checked everything. Yeah, he, cl he cleaned the freezer, I mean, the, the, the refrigerator freezer. And um, when we came back the next day um, and looked, well, we, we didn't look at it. He stood in front of it and he was like, this thing doesn't work. And I said, open it because he was blocking it. And so when he opened it, all of the frost came out. And I was like, yeah, that's a great refrigerator, <laughs> great freezer. And he had, he had happened to find the top of the line fridge. It was a Gen Air. So he couldn't hear the, you know, the, the motor or whatever. But um, we had the work in the freezer for about five years. Um, and we were able to restore it after that. And some of these images that you'll be looking at um, are or the water damage works. These that you see now are a lot of our black and white, some of the things that we took pictures of before the hurricane. Right. Yeah, this image is Gail Darcy. In the early 80s, me and Shauna, we started photographing the demise of black labor in the South because things were changing with automation coming in, the machine, the sugar cane machine came in. So we decided to start photographing life along the river road and uh, in that time, we were able to meet people. And, you know, before Katrina, even now, Louisiana ain't in its best light for its way conditions are. But we were fortunate to start photographing the life on the back roads of Louisiana 
And we've seen that much haven't changed in time since the 30s look like. Some of these pictures have a timeless effect. And even now today, we still visit the back roads of Louisiana and see if some of the conditions have worsened because now there's no need for labor. It's only mainly small prisons that are in these small rural towns. And um, so this is pretty much Chandra here shot. Yeah, uh, this is a sugar cane and it's they, after work in the evenings, they get together, maybe have a beer and they play cards. Um, most of these pictures of sugarcane were taken in the 80s. Uh, I would say 1983 through 87. This is, yeah, Bessie K Plantation. And, yeah, Bessie K Plantation. Is, and this is a young man named Mark Gill who worked in the sugarcane field with his family, uh, with his mother and his father, actually. He was the oldest of 10. But it's something the way the water affected our work and took it to another level that we wouldn't have never dreamed. We don't have to do any Photoshop. We just take them out the freezer and scan them. <laughs> so it's like us finding a new, a new art form, you know, because it's like the colors, the way the, and again, you know, I'm still traditional. I like film. This is mostly Kodachrome film. Yes. For, and froze for three or four years in the freezer. And, and in the beginning, we, we didn't know quite how we were going to attack the um, deal with the restoration. And we were washing our film at first, and the emulsion would just slide right off. Well, some of them. So, we, so we stopped doing that. And uh, <laughs> we had to come up with another, <laughs> another yeah. um, idea. And so we began scanning them, um, and, th and that helped. But the, but the slides, oh, go right here. This series of work on the dock workers, my father was a dock worker. In my community in New Orleans, the docks was the back for black New Orleans, meaning most of the men worked the riverfront. So I grew up with men in my neighborhood who were, I consider heroes of the river because they worked day and night, but they fish and hunt. So I was around all those men growing up. So my first essay was a tribute to my father, the dock workers. And this is some of the images from that series. Um, Shonda was able to help print my first exhibit, and I think that's what fired her up after she seen the Dock Worker series. She was on it, you know. I, I was really fascinated by photography in the dark room. Um, when, I when I first met Keith, a girlfriend of mine, my high school friend, introduced us, and um, she said, yeah, I wanted pictures, and she said, oh, you don't know Keith Calhoun? I was like, who? She was like, Keith Calhoun, and I didn't know him. He was on the football team and all that, but I never knew yeah. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know. My, my girlfriend was really into sports. She knew all the plays for every type of sports game, you know, so she knew players, and so she introduced me to Keith, and, and then um, he took my pictures, and when I called him to see if they were done, he had all of my pictures except he had not printed one. And so he said, you could come and get them, you know, and, and I, I went. My, it, it cost me $150, I want y'all to know that. I don't, know, I don't remember getting all the $150. Yes, you did. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, when I went to get my images, I was so impressed. I loved them. And he said, um, I could print the other one for you if, you if you want. It won't take that long. And I said, oh, sure. You know, so I went into the dark room with him. And when he printed that picture, I was really fascinated by the whole process and watching the image come up. And I asked him to teach me how to print. And that's how I began in the dark room. He always says, oh, you came through the back door. But I think, it, I think that was kind of good for me because I think printing his work or just printing in general, it helped me develop my eye. It made me more frame conscious. And then I started critiquing the things that I was printing and, and processing. <laughs>
And so Kate said, you should shoot, you know. I used to be really shy. I was a shy person. I would never have thought I would be in front of all of you guys speaking. Yeah. But um, I was very shy. And I, I think that photography kind of helped me get out of that. You know, he would embarrass me. We'd go out to shoot and and it'd be an event like this and we'd have to be around and in the front taking pictures and he'd be like, shoot, shoot, film is cheap, shoot, shoot. And he, he'd do that, that nudge me cheap. and do that kind of stuff in yeah. front of people, which was kind of embarrassing for me, but that was his way. <laughs> that was his way of teaching me, you know, I guess, yeah. to not be fearful. Well, the thing is with Chandra, I was fortunate because I remember when we first got together and we, um, which Shonda was beautiful, but also she was very crafty in the darkroom. I didn't like printing, you know, I just wanted to shoot, shoot. But she would encourage me that you need to get closer. You're not, you know, getting it. And so I said, why don't you shoot? And I think that's why I messed up because <laughs> all, <laughs> all my bricks of film, we would go to an event, you know, and I, I'll come back and I see, well, I only had five rows. And she would run the film, and I would look on the rack, she would have like 10 to 12 rows of <laughs> her film. So it was like back and forward. But it worked out because, you know, <laughs> photography is kind of expensive. You know, it was back it's then expensive. when we bought that archival print washer, her girlfriend thought she was crazy. <laughs> we showed them. They said, what you get for they Christmas? They used to show me their rings. Yeah. And, I'm serious. <laughs> they would say, oh, so Chandra, what did you get? for Christmas, and I said, I said, we bought a print washer. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and they would say, a what? <laughs> and they would come over to see it, and they said, that looks like a big fish tank. Yeah. You know, he thought I was crazy, but, I, but I'm that, glad that I wasn't a materialistic person and let that kind of stuff get to me. <laughs> so, want to talk about him? This is a picture of a grand marsha, and, um, you know, in New Orleans, we have so many things to, I mean, for a photographer coming to New Orleans, it's not hard to stay there because there's so much going on. You know, you can just walk down the street and there's imagery every, way, every day. I wake up, there's somewhere I can walk and make an image. So, me and Chandra, in our time now, we was able to create a space in our community where we teach kids in our community how to go out and photograph and document the community because so much is being lost. And if we don't teach the young people the value that the lady down the street might have been a maid up on St. Charles Avenue, but at the same time, she's the mother of our church. And, and to teach the kids the value of that, you know, because now in New Orleans, we losing grandma houses because a lot of the people didn't have successions after Katrina, so now a lot of the people houses are for grab and and it's a kind of scary situation for us. And this is what the second lines look like in New Orleans. Yeah. And um, all of these, these next few pictures and the young man that just finished, that's the Sudan Social and Pleasure Club. Um, and they have different varsities. They have the adults, the junior varsity, and these are the children. And each, each um, organization parades annually every year. So they're doing a slow dirge right here. Actually, with this image, they had a, a member of the group that um, had was deceased, and so um, during their parade, they passed his house, and that's that's why they were solemn. This is, that is the ascension. And this is ascension. It's um, it's an image of five guys. Uh, they are a club, and they're called the Furious Five. But sometimes. All five of them would be in midair, and and that's what I, I was trying to capture. You remind me a lot of the Messiah warriors. Brass band, chosen few. And this is a chosen few brass band. You want to talk about Lois? This is one of my favorite image of Lois Andrews, and if anybody know trombone shorty, that's his mother. And this is called cutting the body loose. Again, in New Orleans, to me, this is how jazz was really born in the streets of New Orleans. People get together. You can be a gardener, a janitor, but you have a send-off like if you were the governor. So that's the only city where you can walk out the door and you find processions just about. That's Lois Andrews again, too. 
and the man in the white suit is her father, Jesse Hill, who made the song Oopoopa Do. <laughs> and that place was called The Shop. It's a, it's a, uh, a storefront where a lot of the older musicians would mentor the younger ones. And it's the Young Tuxedo Brass Band. Um, again, this, some of this work, when we were seeing it, we thought about reticulation and it wasn't any good, so we threw thousands of images away to my son to say, y'all got to think of something. We didn't know. But, um, it, it, you know, every day we find new images. This is the parish prison where the guys would go sometime if they second line near past the prison and second line hollering at the guys at libation, you throw a little, you know, beer, whatever they're drinking on the ground and, and those those little squares in the back around the red and white were windows where at one time they were open and the guys would be fanning towels, hitting cups and all kind of stuff like that. But they still know they come. They just we can't see them because of the glass. Oh. And like with some of the imagery, um, the effects were like the emotion, like this one, scattered all over. Um, and then there's mold that, that's around the edges of all of the images. And um, some of them have a cracked effect and, or shocking, shocked look. And then there are some images that look like they're being swallowed up by a mouth. I've, there are several that have that effect. They're very colorful. I just think that everything that we shot was so colorful, and so you see all of that in, in these images. And this is, you, you probably can't tell, but it's a street corner, and it's like a, a, a parade scene or a gathering scene, people just out. Mm -hmm. Talk about that. What? Do you want to talk about the trumpet? You had to go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Again, again, this is this is a trumpeter, and I I thought that was like a trumpeter from Doc Paulin's band, but. It doesn't matter. This is like one of the images that I was telling you about. They look, it looks to me like, like. Again, wow. trombone shorty as a young man in the back there. I love this, I call it the village. It reminds me of Batik. Um, and it, it just looks like a, I don't know, I look at it as an African scene. The people, he looked like village. And I love the, you know, like the ones that you're gonna be seeing now, they're probably almost like totally abstract. I, I really love that. You can make out, every time we look at them, um, you find or see something different that you didn't this, see. Yeah. I'm, I'm still finding things in the images every day when I look at them that's, that's different or something that I didn't, I've never noticed. And this is one with that like shock crack look to me. And it's, it's also framed, some of them are framed within the slide. And this is like to me, how the water was rushing through, you know? Yeah. And there, there are a few that, that look like that. Well, I never envisioned Kodachrome ever looking like that, but it worked out. <laughs> uh. The other thing is that the Kodachrome held up so well. I mean, even though we just have this, um, people used to tease us about shooting Kodachrome in black and white because we had to print the pictures for them or either with the Kodachrome we had to go and get an inner negative and then print that and you know bring them a picture and a lot of our um, colleagues who were shooting print film you know they swore by the print film they were like oh y'all can't give people pictures on time so they would like beat us to people giving people pictures it didn't matter but they didn't understand to me the permanency of slides of Kodachrome. 
and, and the black and white film because they shot a lot of print. Well. Yeah. So. This is. Um, you? Yeah, these are, these are all just the abstract works. Like this is, I don't know, tapestry looking to me. You want to sing? Uh. Well, I thank you all for sharing our. I mean, I'm happy to share the. We're happy to share the work with you all, and we thank you all for coming out to listen to us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are you getting? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm a little far by. Oh, thank you.